This is section 84 of Mark Twain's Speeches by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Aid of the Blind by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Address at a public meeting of the New York Association for Promoting the Interests of the Blind at the Waldorf Astoria, March 29, 1906. If you detect any awkwardness in my movements, and infelicities in my conduct, I will offer the explanation that I never presided at a meeting of any kind before in my life, and that I do find it out of my line. I supposed I could do anything anybody else could, but I recognize that experience helps, and I do feel the lack of that experience. I don't feel as graceful and easy as I ought to be in order to impress an audience. I shall not pretend that I know how to umpire a meeting like this, and I shall just take the humble place of the Essex band. There was a great gathering in a small New England town about twenty-five years ago. I remember that circumstance because there was something that happened at that time. It was a great occasion. They gathered in the militia and orators, and everybody from all the towns around. It was an extraordinary occasion. The little local paper threw itself into ecstasies of admiration and tried to do itself proud from beginning to end. It praised the orators, the militia, and all the bands that came from everywhere, and all this in honest country newspaper detail. But the writer ran out of adjectives towards the end. Having exhausted his whole magazine of praise and glorification, he found he still had one band left over. He had to say something about it, and he said, The Essex band done the best it could. <clears throat> I am an Essex band on this occasion, and I am going to get through as well as inexperience and good intentions will enable me. I have got all the documents here necessary to instruct you in the objects and intentions of this meeting, and also of the association which has called the meeting. But they are too voluminous. I could not pack those statistics into my head, and I had to give it up. I shall have to just reduce all that mass of statistics to a few salient facts. There are too many statistics and figures for me. I never could do anything with figures, never had any talent for mathematics, never accomplished anything in my efforts at that rugged study, and today the only mathematics I know is multiplication, and the minute I get away up in that, as soon as I reach nine times seven— Mr. Clemens lapsed into deep thought for a moment. He was trying to figure out nine times seven, but it was a hopeless task, and he turned to St. Clair McElway, who sat near him. Mr. McElway whispered the answer, and the speaker resumed. "'I've got it now. It's eighty-four. Well, I can get that far all right with a little hesitation. After that I am uncertain, and I can't manage a statistic. This association for the—' Mr. Clemens was in another dilemma. Again he was obliged to turn to Mr. McElway. Oh, yes, uh, for promoting the interests of the blind. It's a long name. If I could, I would write it out for you and let you take it home and study it. But I don't know how to spell it. And Mr. Carnegie is down in Virginia somewhere. Well, anyway, the object of that association, which has been recently organized, five months ago, in fact, is in the hands of very, very energetic, intelligent, and capable people, and they will push it to success very surely, and all the more surely 
if you will give them a little of your assistance out of your pockets. The intention, the purpose, is to search out all the blind and find work for them to do so that they may earn their own bread. Now it is dismal enough to be blind, it is dreary, dreary life at best, but it can be largely ameliorated by finding something for these poor blind people to do with their hands. The time passes so heavily that it is never day or night with them, it is always night and when they have to sit with folded hands and with nothing to do to amuse or entertain or employ their minds it is drearier and drearier and then the knowledge they have that they must subsist on charity and so often reluctant charity it would renew their lives if they could have something to do with their hands and pass their time and at the same time earn their bread and know the sweetness of the bread which is the result of the labor of one's own hands they need that cheer and pleasure it is the only way you can turn their night into day to give them happy hearts the only thing you can put in the place of the blessed sun that you can do in the way i speak of blind people generally who have seen the light know what it is to miss the light those who have gone blind since they were twenty years old their lives are unendingly dreary but they can be taught to use their hands and to employ themselves at a great many industries that association from which this draws its birth in cambridge massachusetts has taught its blind to make many things they make them better than most people and more honest than people who have the use of their eyes the goods they make are readily saleable people like them and so they are supporting themselves and it is a matter of cheer cheer they pass their time now not too irksomely as they formerly did what this association needs and wants is fifteen thousand dollars the figures are set down and what the money is for and there is no graft in it or i would not be here and they hope to beguile that out of your pockets and you will find affixed to the program an opportunity that little blank which you will fill out and promise so much money now or tomorrow or sometime then there is another opportunity which is still better and that is that you shall subscribe an annual sum i have invented a good many useful things in my time but never anything better than that of getting money out of people who don't want to part with it it is always for good objects of course this is the plan when you call upon a person to contribute to a great and good object and you think he should furnish about one thousand dollars he disappoints you as like as not much the best way to work him to supply that thousand dollars is to split it into parts and contribute say a hundred dollars a year or fifty or whatever the sum may be let him contribute ten or twenty a year he doesn't feel that but he does feel it when you call upon him to contribute a large amount when you get used to it you would rather contribute than borrow money i tried it in helen keller's case mr hutton wrote me in eighteen ninety six or eighteen ninety seven when i was in london and said the gentleman who has been so liberal in taking care of helen keller has died without making provision for her in his will and now they don't know what to do they were proposing to raise a fund and he thought fifty thousand dollars enough to furnish an income of two thousand four hundred or two thousand five hundred a year for the support of that wonderful girl and her wonderful teacher miss sullivan now mrs macy i wrote to mr hutton and said go on 
get up your fund it will be slow but if you want quick work i propose this system the system i speak of of asking people to contribute such and such a sum from year to year and drop out whenever they please and he would find there wouldn't be any difficulty people wouldn't feel the burden of it and he wrote back saying he had raised the twenty four hundred a year indefinitely by that system in a single afternoon we would like to do something just like that tonight we will take as many checks as you care to give you can leave your donations in the big room outside i knew once what it was to be blind i shall never forget that experience i have been as blind as anybody ever was for three or four hours and the sufferings that i endured and the mishaps and the accidents that are burning in my memory make my sympathy rise when i feel for the blind and always shall feel i once went to heidelberg on an excursion i took a clergyman along with me the rev joseph twitchell of hartford who is still among the living despite that fact i always travel with clergymen when i can it is better for them it is better for me and any preacher who goes out with me in stormy weather and without a lightning rod is a good one the rev twitchell is one of those people filled with patience and endurance two good ingredients for a man traveling with me so we got along very well together in that old town they have not altered a house nor built one in fifteen hundred years we went to the inn and they placed twitchell and me in a most colossal bedroom the largest i ever saw or heard of it was as big as this room i didn't take much notice of the place i didn't really get my bearings i noticed twitchell got a german bed about two feet wide the kind in which you've got to lie on your edge because there isn't room to lie on your back and he was way down the south in that big room and i was way up north at the other end of it with a regular sahara in between we went to bed twitchell went to sleep but then he had his conscience loaded and it was easy for him to get to sleep i couldn't get to sleep it was one of those torturing kinds of lovely summer nights when you hear various kinds of noises now and then a mouse away off in the southwest you throw things at the mouse that encourages the mouse but i couldn't stand it and about two o'clock i got up and thought i would give it up and go out in the square where there was one of those tinkling fountains and sit on its brink and dream full of romance i got out of bed and i ought to have lit a candle but i didn't think of it until it was too late it was the darkest place that ever was there has never been darkness any thicker than that it just lay in cakes i thought that before dressing i would accumulate my clothes i pawed around in the dark and found everything packed together on the floor except one sock i couldn't get on the track of that sock it might have occurred to me that maybe it was in the wash but i didn't think of that i went excursioning on my hands and knees presently i thought i am never going to find it i'll go back to bed again that is what i tried to do during the next three hours i had lost the bearings of that bed i was going in the wrong direction all the time by and by i came in collision with a chair and that encouraged me it seemed to me as far as i could recollect there was only a chair here and there and yonder five or six of them scattered over this territory and i thought maybe after i found that chair i might find the next one well i did and i found another and another and another i kept going around on my hands and knees having those sudden collisions and finally when i banged into another chair i almost lost my temper and i raised up 
garbed as I was, not for public exhibition, right in front of a mirror fifteen or sixteen feet high. I hadn't noticed the mirror, didn't know it was there, and when I saw myself in the mirror I was frightened out of my wits. I don't allow any ghosts to bite me, and I took up a chair and smashed at it. A million pieces. Then I reflected. That's the way I always do, and it's unprofitable unless a man has had much experience that way and has clear judgment. And I had judgment, and I would have had to pay for that mirror if I hadn't recollected to say it was Twitchell who broke it. Then I got down on my hands and knees and went on another exploring expedition. As far as I could remember, there were six chairs in that Oklahoma, and one table, a great big heavy table, not a good table to hit with your head when rushing madly along. In the course of time I collided with thirty-five chairs, and tables enough to stock that dining room out there. It was a hospital for decayed furniture, and it was in a worse condition when I got through with it. I went on and on, and at last got to a place where I could feel my way up, and there was a shelf. I knew that wasn't in the middle of the room. Up to that time I was afraid I had gotten out of the city. I was very careful and pawed along that shelf, and there was a pitcher of water about a foot high, and it was at the head of Twitchell's bed but I didn't know it. I felt that pitcher going, and I grabbed at it, but it didn't help any, and came right down in Twitchell's face, and nearly drowned him, but it woke him up. I was grateful to have company on any terms. He lit a match, and there I was, way down south, when I ought to have been back up yonder. My bed was out of sight, it was so far away. You needed a telescope to find it. Twitchell comforted me, and I scrubbed him off, and we got sociable. But that night wasn't wasted. I had my pedometer on my leg. Twitchell and I were in a pedometer match. Twitchell had longer legs than I. The only way I could keep up was to wear my pedometer to bed. I always walk in my sleep and on this occasion I gained sixteen miles on him. After all, I never found that sock. I never have seen it from that day to this. But that adventure taught me what it is to be blind. That was one of the most serious occasions of my whole life. Yet I never can speak of it without somebody thinking it isn't serious. You try it and see how serious it is to be as the blind are, and I was that night." Mr. Clemens read several letters of regret. He then introduced Joseph H. Choate, saying, "'It is now my privilege to present to you Mr. Choate. I don't have to really introduce him. I don't have to praise him or to flatter him. I could say truly that in the forty-seven years I have been familiarly acquainted with him, he has always been the handsomest man America has ever produced, and I hope and believe he will hold the belt forty-five years more. He has served his country ably, faithfully, and brilliantly. He stands at the summit, at the very top in the esteem and regard of his countrymen. And if I could say one word which would lift him any higher in his countrymen's esteem and affection, I would say that word, whether it was true or not. End of In Aid of the Blind by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman